In the process of formulating those assertions that we made on the last slide, you're going to want to look at the scientific literature to see whether the question that you're asking has already been asked and answered. And if not, what are the things that people have done so far that back up why this question that you're asking is important to answer? As you do this, there's a couple of different places you can go to try to understand what's out there. And a couple of good starting points are pubmed.gov, which it might be worth looking at editorials, review articles, and original research in this area. But in particular, editorials and reviews can give you a good sense of what's already been done. So I encourage you to consider starting with those first, especially if this area is new to you. Google Scholar has similar kind of search functionalities as PubMed, and so that's another place to consider. One place I didn't list on here is tripdatabase.com. And Trip Database basically lets you do a PICO search for the question. And so this is a kind of the most direct way to enter the PICO terms in directly and see if you can get um, an answer to what literature exists out there in, uh, related to the topic. Other things that are definitely not worth discounting are online news sources. And while the news sources are not gonna be the source of primary literature, it can help you figure out how big of a problem something is. Because typically the important problems of our day are things that are being reported in the news media in addition to being reported in the scientific literature. And so this is not an end point, but it may be a good starting point to find out what are the current controversies, the current questions of the day that are worth looking into. Similarly, patient community forums may be a good place to go to hear what patients' concerns are. And if you have a data set in mind, you might want to go to the website um, that explains that data set because that may help you figure out as that data set was being collected, what was the primary reason for its collection? What types of questions was it designed to answer? Because chances are the questions that it was designed to answer have already been at least attempted to be answered, whereas other questions that were not in the scope of the original collection of the data set uh, you know, might have gone unanswered because that wasn't the reason the data was collected. So always ask yourself, if the question has not been asked, why not? If the question has been asked but not answered, how come? Maybe it's not possible to answer it using that data set for some reason. And if the question has been asked and answered, was the answer good enough? Was the answer like an exact answer to the question that you have? Or was it related but not the same? And so it's something that you can build on by trying to leverage what's already been done to support the argument for the question that you want to answer. Always be mindful of whose problem it is that your question is addressing. Because depending on who's on the other end of your elevator pitch, your pitch is going to be slightly different to speak to their needs in particular. So in the example of this first question, does the choice of antibiotic for the treatment of bloodstream infections dictate how long a patient will stay in the hospital? This question by itself is relevant to patients, clinicians, hospital administrators, as well as to insurance companies. And imagine that there's two antibiotics that are equally effective, but the first antibiotic lets you go home a day sooner uh, than the second antibiotic. And maybe that's because the first antibiotic is oral and can be taken as a pill, and maybe the second antibiotic is only available intravenously or IV, and so patients have to stick around an additional day in the hospital to get it. If you're making this pitch to an insurance company, your pitch might effectively be that this problem is important to look at because if we find that these two antibiotics are equally effective, patients basically need to stay one day less in the hospital and that will save you a ton of money. And that's why it's important to do this analysis. If you're making this pitch to uh, patients, you can basically tell them, you can basically just take a pill if we find these two antibiotics are equally effective. This will save you having to get an IV It'll save you time off, you know, time off work that you have to be in the hospital and will let you recover kind of in your own comfort zone at home. And so, again, these questions are important to a lot of different stakeholders, but you can pitch the importance of the question specifically when you know who that stakeholder is that you're speaking to. In the example, the second question, does, do no texting signs on the freeways reduce the incidence of texting while driving? That question might certainly be valuable to the general public and a lot of other stakeholders. But I would say the primary audience for that question is uh, uh, policymakers. 
Because if you're in a state or a city and you're thinking of implementing a policy that puts up no texting signs everywhere, you'll want to know other places that have tried it. Have they had success in actually reducing the number of accidents? Because if they haven't, then you're going to have a tough time making this case to the folks that you speak to um, and to the general public when they ask you, why did you put this policy in place? So always think about who the problem is addressing uh, for the question that you have and make sure that your pitch is backed up or is kind of uh, tailored for that audience. You'll also want to make sure that the way you ask the question is actually answerable. So the first part of that is, is the question well-defined? So we already talked about the elements that go into PICO, but make sure that the question that you're asking includes a population, an intermission or exposure, includes a comparison group and an outcome. And ideally your question should be answerable with a yes or a no. Because if you ask a really vague question, at the end of your analysis of the data, you may not be able to tell people a yes or a no. And that makes it very unclear what you've actually learned from the exercise that you did. And at the outset, it makes it unclear what exactly you're looking for. So let's think through some of these questions. Does coffee cause cancer? Is exposure to chemotherapy associated with development of nausea? That first question is, has an exposure. It doesn't really have a population. It doesn't say, is this among the general public? Is this among specific type of patients who already have risk factors for cancer? There's no comparison group. Um, and there is an outcome, but it is vague. Is this all cancers or is this a specific type of cancer? Whereas in the second question, we've done a lot better. We've said, you know, that the exposure is exposure to chemotherapy. We've defined the outcome of the development of nausea, but we haven't necessarily specified the population. So is this patients with all cancer? There's other reasons why people get chemotherapy. Um, certain rheumatologic conditions people have to get chemotherapy for to reduce the inflammation. Are we looking at those as well? And finally, we haven't really said what the comparison group is. And you can imagine that if you're comparing this group that was exposed to chemotherapy with the general public, you're asking a very different question than you're comparing people who got one chemotherapy to another chemotherapy. And so again, the comparison group will really dictate what question it is that you're answering and whether your question is actually important and worth answering in the first, first place. Take a look at these other three questions and see if you can figure out whether these are answerable as they're stated and whether they have the elements of the PICO built into them. After thinking a lot about the types of questions that you could ask, you arrive at this question, does coffee cause heart disease? Now, admittedly, this question does not contain all the PICO elements in it, but let's say for the sake of this example, that this is the question that you've chosen and you've found a data set on the web that you think might be able to answer this question. So what would this data set need to contain for you to actually be able to use it to answer this question? So not surprisingly, the first thing that this data set would need to contain is the exposure variable. So does the data set tell you how much coffee individuals drink for every row in the data set? Next, you'd wanna make sure that the data set contains the outcome variable. So does the data set tell you who has cancer or who's developed cancer and who hasn't? You'd also wanna make sure that the data set all, has all the variables in it that might be potential confounders. And we'll come back to this idea of what a confounder is, but just know that some of the confounders in this situation include things like age, sex, and smoking, and we'll come back to why that is. Next, you'd like to be able to potentially establish causation between the exposure and the outcome. And what I'm not saying here is that we'll be able to establish causation in our analysis, because the types of analyses we'll be talking about in this class are not designed to try to establish causation. However, an obvious situation here would be that you wanna make sure the coffee exposure happened before the development of cancer. And if that's not true, then it's not even really plausible that you could start to establish causation based on your analysis. So for example, if the data set has a question, do you currently drink coffee? and the data set has a question, have you ever had cancer? It could be 
the case that people who have had cancer now drink coffee. And so even though we can't make a causal claim regardless based on the types of analysis we'll be doing, it would be kind of laughable to try to use that to answer this question because the data set, the exposure and outcome are reversed. That's not to say you might not do it you know, for the purpose of the midterm assignment. You still might choose that data set to look at this for the assignment, but you'd want to you know, be very clear that this is a major limitation of your analysis. There also may be biases in the way the data is collected and by whom it is collected. And obviously, depending on the purpose for why that data was collected, there might be data that's systematically missing, variables that are systematically not asked, or you know, there's missing values that depend on the reason that that data was collected that might impact your ability to make any kind of uh, claims about answering the question. There's another issue of, you know, are there enough people in the data set where you could plausibly answer this question? And this is related to the concept of statistical power that we'll come back to later in this uh, class. But an obvious example would be, let's say you only had five people in this data set. If two people drink coffee, three people don't, and two people have cancer, regardless of the combination of how those people are distributed, you're not going to be able to make any kind of claim based on that data set, even to look at an association, because there's just not enough people there. And again, we mentioned you know, the, the biases are related to the way the data is collected. But just to re reiterate, there might be biases in the data based on the reason for why that data set was collected. I mentioned that age, sex, and smoking might be potential confounders that impact the relationship between coffee drinking and the development of cancer. And so what is a confounder? A confounder is a variable that influences both the intervention or exposure and the outcome. And remember that in PICO, you are studying the relationship between the I and the O. So you want to know, does the intervention relate to the outcome? And so if there is a variable that affects both the intervention and it affects the outcome, you can't reliably measure the relationship between the intervention and the outcome unless you account for this variable. If you're looking at the relationship between coffee use and drinking, what if I told you that smoking is actually associated with coffee use? So people who smoke tend to also drink a lot of coffee. And we know that smoking is a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Could you possibly make any claims about associations or a relationship between coffee use and heart disease if you don't take into account smoking? And smoking isn't shown on this diagram, but imagine that it's at the bottom of this diagram with an arrow pointing from smoking to coffee use and from smoking to heart disease. And the fact is you would not be able to look at this relationship unless you look separately at smokers and non-smokers or you adjust for smoking in your analysis. If you wanted to look at the risk of someone dying as a result of chronic kidney disease, the obvious confounder would be age. Because as people age, their risk of chronic kidney disease goes way up. And obviously age is associated with mortality as people get older. So in order to evaluate the relationship between chronic kidney disease and mortality, we'd have to account for age. And if you were to not account for age and look simply at the association between chronic kidney disease and mortality, we would refer to this as an unadjusted analysis or a naive analysis, where we're kind of just looking at the association without accounting for anything that might be confounding that relationship. And it's pretty common in scientific papers to see people start with reporting an unadjusted analysis before they go on to account for any kind of confounding. We've talked about a couple examples of confounding, but what do you think possible confounders might be when looking at some of these relationships? So for example, what are the possible confounders that might affect the relationship between smoking and heart attacks? And as I already alluded to, we know that smoking is a risk factor for heart disease, but how much of that risk actually comes from the smoking itself?